beautiful. <laughs> Thank you very much. Primeramente, first of all, I would like to acknowledge the spirits of this place that is Victoria, Texas, and the University of Houston in Victoria. For it is because of our ancestors that we are here. And I always like to begin by acknowledging that. And secondly, I want to thank everyone. First of all, you all who are here, who made time in your day to be here. Some of you, I know, are doing this as part of a class. But many of you are here because you choose to be here and take out the time from your day and want to be here. And I also want to very, very uh, much so thank all of the people who are responsible for ABR's reading series. I know how difficult it is to get the funding, get the microphone, get the lights, get everything to happen. So muchas gracias. And thank you also for my welcoming committee this morning, Macarena, Pete, Carol, thank you. Uh, it's just, it just feels really like home. And I say that with all the deepest warmth that I can bring to Victoria. It's my first time being at the university, although like I was telling Macarena, I've driven through Victoria many times. I would like to, um, let's see, are we ready with this? <laughs> this is what I'm going to do today. First of all, the overview, it's, I'm going to talk a little bit about the geography and history off the border. I'm going to do a reading from Canicula and then from Champu, and then we'll break at 1245 so that those of you who have another class to go to can proceed and go to the class. And then I'll come back. The light is really bothering me. That's better. Uh, and then we'll come back and do the Q&A, all right? So this begins on the border, and these are the sister cities that I'm sure you're familiar with. And I don't have to tell you about the border because you're in South Texas. Usually when I do readings outside of Texas, I have to explain a lot of things. I'm not going to do that today. I'm just going to give you a little bit of a context for the reading. This is what the bridge in Laredo looked like many years ago. This is what it looks like now. And I'm sure you re recognize the long lines <laughs> if you've ever been there. It has a legacy of racism that begins with signs like this one that used to be prevalent in this area many, many years ago. But it is also that legacy translated into contemporary signs and signifiers of that racism, such as the border wall. Here's one uh, from Cameron County, right behind someone's backyard. That's the border wall. So the story is a story of my antepasados, of my ancestors. Here you see my grand aunt, my paternal grandfather's sister, on the left, and my dad's youngest sister on the right, my tia Piedad and my tia Lucita. And they're in the street in Mexico City. So the story may be about the border, but it extends north and south quite a bit. It is the story of my grandfather. This is my maternal grandfather in a photo taken in San Antonio sometime in the 30s. And I always talk about how you can date it because of this little teddy bear that's right on the running board. We didn't really have teddy bears until Teddy Roosevelt, so it must be around that time. It's a story of my parents in this photo taken in about 1955 in Monterrey at a cousin's wedding. And it is a story of my mother before she even got married in Nuevo Laredo at the plaza, uh, donning what she would uh, later ask me to wear, and that is the China Poblana dress. And I'll talk a little bit more about that China Poblana later. And it is a story of my cousins on the border. This picture was taken in Matamoros, across from Brownsville in the uh, 60s, and uh, back in Laredo in the 50s at some point with my grandmother. My maternal grandmother lived with us until I was 12 when she passed on. And th there she is again, surrounded by granddaughters. And uh, I always point out to that photographs are always important in my family. This is a photograph of my brother and I when we were kids. There's a photograph over here of my, gra my paternal grandparents' 50th wedding anniversary, but also religion. Here's a calendar. And also crafts. And this is a crochet dress on this doll over here. And it is a story of my siblings. In this case, it's actually my cousin and 
that I am right here, there's my sister and my brother, Florentino, who was killed in Vietnam in 1968. And there it's my story, of course. Here I am on a rocking horse that my maternal grandfather made for me. And here I am wearing already my signature bracelets and <laughs> earrings <laughs> at age one. And at age three, wearing boots, of course, in Texas. And giving, having given myself a haircut, I cut my bangs <laughs> over here. But here I am wearing that China Poblana dress. Now, the China Poblana dress in the 1950s is what little girls wore for George Washington's birthday in Laredo. And many of you may know that Laredo celebrates George Washington's birthday. We've been doing that for over 100 years, since 1898. And uh, there are many reasons for it. I won't go into them now. Suffice it to say that as a little girl, that was one of the highlights of the year, that big celebration of George Washington's birthday. And my mother would dress me and my sister later in the China Poblana dress. But in school, we were dressed in cowgirl outfits. And so there was this constant back and forth that happened. And then there's the religious aspect of it as well. This is my junior high school picture. And this constant back and forth of the public and the private, the school and the home of identities is part of everyday life on the border. Many of us had to contend with being monolingual Spanish speakers at home. Although my mom was born in Corpus, she did not speak uh, Span English at home, so we spoke Spanish. And English monolingual speaking at school. We were punished if we, didn't, if we spoke Spanish at school. And so that constantly back and forth is also reflected in the identity. Here, um, color blanco at age, well, I don't know, I, I was about a year old here. And here, uh, color moreno. And I put this up just to show that in some ways the state is the one that assigns identity to its citizens. And uh, then this is a high school picture. This is the staff of the journal, which was our newspaper for the school. So I've been writing for a long time. But one of the curious things about this picture, and I don't talk about it in the book, but I'll share this with you. I was assigned to write the astrological column for the newspaper. Now, <laughs> at 17, I knew nothing about how to do astrology charts or anything. I made it all up. Oh. <laughs> no one complained, so I guess I did a good job with it. <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into the, the reading. I'll begin with the epigraphs. Brinca la tablita, yo ya la brinque. Brinca la de vuelta, yo ya me cansé. The children's game. All photographs are memento mori, Susan Sontag. The U.S.-Mexican border es una herida abierta where the third world grates against the first and bleeds Gloria and Sardua. On a hot, hot, hot August day, the chichara drum forces me to the press and they madly hum incessantly, insistently, a long row of cotton to be picked, capullos de algodón, nothing moves, the dust is settled on the green leaves, el olor a sudor, heavy odor of sweat, I wear with a blue plaid flannel shirt, can't get away from it, as comforting in its intimacy as mommy's sweet scent of talcum powder and sweat. Sun's so bright it hurts, my eyes barely look at it and I see bright red spots. Sweat runs in rivulets along my back. The acrid smell of the pesticide nauseates, sticks to the cushy, dusty, white fruit, glassy fibers in my fingers. I pull as carefully as when I pick a burr off my socks. I hold and stash tiny white filament, so soft as barba de chivo weed we harvest from Doña Carmen's fence when playing comadritas. Slowly, I fill the saca, custom made by mommy to fit a nine-year-old shoulder. He'll bring 50 cents, maybe even a dollar. Don Guillermo writes it all down in his book when I go with papi to empty the saca in la troca. Strange insects, frailecillo, chinches, garrapatas, hormigas, some or all of these pests. Ticks, fleas, tiny spiders, the color of sand, some or all of these bichos find their way to exposed ankles, arms, necks 
and suck lifeblood, leaving wells strong chests, red and itchy, and even pus-filled ampullas that burst and burn with the sun. In the photo, smiles belie tired, aching feet and backs, smiles on serious faces, stiff bodies posed for life. And in the distance, the river slithers silently down to the end or the beginning. And high above in the heavens, a speck of metal, a jet from the north flies south, leaves a trail of white cloud like a tail on a homemade paper kite. That's the first piece in, in the book. And there is no photograph. When I asked my mom why we didn't have a photograph, she kind of was perplexed and says, estábamos trabajando, piscando. <laughs> we were out in the fields picking cotton, so why would we have photographs? Uh, uh, but I wanted that image to start the book because it sets the South Texas sun, that life out on, on, on the fields, but it also sets the mood of having things happening outside, the plane flying overhead as well as what's going on on that very geopolitical space of the border. And the three epigraphs give you a hint that it's about childhood and the transition, but it's also about memory and elusive, how elusive memory can be. And of course, it's also about that herida abierta that Gloria Saldua describes. May. Dalia, Bueli, Tino, Cousin Lalo, and I pose one mobby May evening in front of the four-room frame house on San Carlos Street. I and Dalia wear white organdy, recycled First Communion garb. I am all long skinny legs and arms and a flash of white teeth. Later, we'll pick flowers, bouquets of tiny blossoms, San Dieguito, clumps of sweet-smelling ivory-white jasmine, flecks of white on green stems, resedad. Bright white daisies we call margaritas and leafy, spiky, deep green fern to offer them to Mary at San Luis Rey Church as we sing, Oh Maria, Madre Mia, Oh Consuelo del Mortal, Ampararnos y Guiarnos a la Puerta Celestial. And we pray the rosary. The smell of incense so strong I want to faint. Instead, I'll count the lines on the inside of my wrist. Each stands for 20 years of my life, according to my cousin Peppa. I'll dream of going to Monterrey, eating a piruli, a candy that lasts all day long. And you place it in a glass of water overnight so it'll keep. Later, after the rosary, after the walk home, and the cup of yerba buena tea, I'll lie on the floor, out on the porch, on a thick colcha, and I'll count the stars Sin cuenta, I smile at the joke, without count, something just like the number 50, sin cuenta, all at once. Maybe I'll wish on a falling star that May will forever be like this. Tino, he did it at four and again at nine. He stands to the sign with his hand out as if pointing a gun or a rifle. Everyone else is crowded around me. The piñata in the shape of a birthday cake sways in the wind above our heads. Everyone is there. Aunts, uncles, cousins, the neighbors, my madrina, everyone, even Mama Grande Lupita from Monterrey. I'm holding the stick decorated with red, blue, yellow tissue paper we will use to break the piñata. And he's playing, even in the picture at being a soldier. Only 10 years later, 1968, he is a soldier and it's not a game. And we are gathered again, tias, tios, comadres, cousins, neighbors, everyone, even Mama Grande Lupita from Monterrey. And Papi's cousin Ricardo, who has escorted the body home. We have all gathered around a flag, drape, coffin. Tino has come home from Vietnam, my brother. The sound of the trumpet caresses our hearts, and Mommy's gentle sobbing sways in the cool wind of March. We spoke earlier about the China Poblana and how we were uh, dressed like this for George Washington's birthday. Let me just give you a very quick uh, explanation. The China Poblana outfit signifies Mexican womanhood. Now how a Chinese woman from Puebla 
comes the signified Mexican woman, which is a very long story. I'm not going to go there. But I do want to say that it was in my analysis of, of this phenomenon for that celebration. I'm a folklorist, so I study fiestas and celebrations and rites of passage. And what I have deduced is that it was an attempt by the local Mexicano community that had been there since before 1848, when the border becomes the border, to reinstate and reinscribe their Mexicanness onto their cultural traditions. So yes, we'll celebrate George Washington's birthday, but we'll do it our way. And so even though the George Washington's birthday celebration has their very elaborate colonial ball with all the presentations, and then the Princess Pocahontas, and all of those aspects, the community would dress their kids in charro and china poblana outfits as a way of resisting that. Smiling, I look straight at the camera. I grin a smile, squint on the bright sun. Must be around noon, not a shadow shows. We have just returned from the George Washington's birthday parade. I hold up my china poblana skirt and point my toe as I stand for the photo. Mammy has braided my shoulder long hair adding volume and length with yarn, green, white, red, verde, blanco y colorado, la bandera del soldado. The dazzlingly white blouse embroidered with bright silk to shape flowers like the ones that grow in our yard, roses, hibiscus, geraniums, even some that look like the tiny blossoms of the moss roses remind me of summer, although it's a warm February day. I know Raul is hiding behind his dad's car to make fun of me. I pretend not to notice, though. Instead of his teasing, I hear a whistle, a wolf whistle, and I become even more upset than if he had called me skinny or wet back, yell his favorite taunts, mojada, flaca. I mustn't move because mommy wants me to stand perfectly still until she takes the picture. I resist the urge to grab a stone and hit Raul with it. My aim is good and I know exactly where he is. If only I could. And I feel like the chalupa in the Loteria game like Maria Felix, Dolores del Rio, a movie star frozen in costume. But then it's all gone, just like the Dutch Remolino that came up unexpectedly and left us all dusty. A lonely urraca lets out a loud calling in the noon heat, predicting a change of weather, warning of the freezing winds that will hit later that afternoon and cut into my face as I ride the Wheel of Fortune at the carnival, where I'll bite into pink fluff of sugar and find it disappear into sweetness. We go inside the frame house and have lunch, sopa de arroz, picadillo guisado, fresh corn tortillas with orange flavored Kool-Aid. Mommy tells Welly I'm growing so fast the costume won't fit next year. Dahlia will wear it to the parade. I cringe and I want to cry, but I won't let the thought spoil the present and I ask, can I buy cotton candy at the carnival? Maybe I'll even win a little pink or blue chick to keep me company, and I do. But when the chick becomes a chicken, well, he wrings its neck, drains the blood, and we have arroz con pollo for Easter. <laughs> well, uh, I'm going to switch to now. Well, maybe I'll do one more, although I don't have a picture for it. Uh, piojos. <laughs> With joyous anticipation, I arrive home to find Mama Grande and Tia Lidia visiting from Monterrey. I can't wait to tell Mommy the news. So right after kissing the visitors, hello, I blurted out, tengo piojos. <laughs> I explained that at recess, the nurse who had come from the main office had lined us up for inspection, and along with checking our eyes and our ears, she had taken a popsicle stick, parted our hair, checking for lice. Just like San Juana, Chelito, and Peewee, and most of my friends, I too wanted to be sent to the office to get the yellow slip that confirmed we had lice. <laughs> when the nurse nodded and pointed to the office, I felt I belonged. <laughs> Just the same way I would sometimes misspell a word on adrede during spelling bee so I could go sit with my friends and not have to stay up there and be teased later and be called teacher's pet. With my announcement, I handed mommy the precious yellow slip with instructions for taking care of the problem. But the instructions were in English. I had to translate down to the gory details of what would happen if I didn't get my problem solved. 
poor mommy. Here she was trying to impress her mother-in-law, and I come and ruin it. <laughs> Mama Grande was scandalized, but she had solutions. She told mommy what kind of soap to buy and proceeded to espulgar right then and there. I soon realized the big event was no fun. I had to sit with my head on Mama Grande's lap that smelled of Monterrey, and she would pull and tug at my hair whenever she spotted a liendre or a louse crawling on my scalp. The whole weekend was spent taking care of my problem. By Monday, we all compared notes on what torture having piojos meant. The stinking shampoos, the rough soaps, the pink plastic comb with teeth so fine, only the tiniest of lice could get away. Only Olegario teased and bragged how he liked having the critters running on his scalp, how his hair was so black they could hide really well in there. <laughs> but in a few days, he came back with his parents' solution to the problem, a shaved head. <laughs> From then on, he became Pelon, a name he kept through junior high and high school when he fought the dress code so he could wear his hair long. Next time, the critters found a home in my hair. I didn't brag nor did I come home with the same sense of anticipation I did that first time. I knew better. Sometimes, though, I would pretend to feel the crawling, itching signs of lice so I could lay my head on Mommy or Welly's lap and feel their gentle fingers caress my hair lovingly and find nothing. <laughs> OK, now I'm going to read from a new uh, Work in progress. This is a novel I've been working on for about three, maybe four years now, called Champu or Hair Matters. It takes place in Laredo again, and uh, the story, it's a pretty intricately structured narrative, but it's also these very short pieces that are braided together. <coughs> Excuse me. The main point is that it is a beauty shop in Laredo, and in the front it's a beauty shop, in the back there's, it's a, in a home that has been transfor transformed into a beauty shop, and in the back Doña Lola reads cards on Tuesdays and Fridays, and in the front Diamond, or Diamantina, her name's Diamantina, everybody calls her Diamond, does the hair and the nails and the makeup and the waxing and all the other stuff. Forgiveness. And this is one of the pieces where somebody's coming in, talking. Jamás te perdonaré haberme sacado del aredo. That's what my mom said in a brief and rare moment of lucidity before she died, Diamond. Can you believe it? After over 60 years of living in San Antonio, she comes up with something like this. My poor dad, he was shattered. I never knew that she didn't want to leave Laredo or that it had been his idea to relocate the family farther inland. It was as far as she would go, Dad told me when I asked later in the hospital coffee shop. His plan had been to move to Chicago, but Mom would have none of it. They were newlyweds, only had Polly then. I think she was a year old at the time. You could tell it still pained him, that widening river of resentment and pain that ran between them to the end. He took care of her as if she were a child there at the end. Como la quería. How he must have hurt, too. I can only imagine. All this time, I believed in their undying love. I'm sure that existed, too. How else do you share your life with someone at the same time resent what they did to your lives? They were so close. Did everything together until she started getting sick. Yeah, yeah, that was in the room when she said it. We all were there. That's who she was talking to. She looked directly at him. She could hardly speak. It was towards the end. We were all there in the hospital room, my brother and sisters, Dad and I, cocking our heads, trying to understand what she was saying. And then she just blurted it out, loud and clear. Nunca te perdonaré que me sacaste del aredo. Alzheimer's is like that. Sometimes I feel that I'm closer to her now that she's gone than in those months before she passed, when she was so gone, she didn't even recognize me, her daughter, her coyotita like she called me because I was her youngest, the baby. I have so many memories of those last days. At another time, she was struggling to talk, and we didn't know what she wanted, couldn't understand, didn't know whether she was really lucid or wanted to say something profound, or whether she was just rambling, as she used to, repeating the same thing over and over and over, getting upset over things that happened years ago. 
like when she was talking about her mother dying and accusing my brother of keeping the information from her. He was her caretaker at that time. She wasn't on a wheelchair yet and more often than not could still remember things and talk as if nothing. If you didn't know you would believe she was okay. Do you remember, Diamond? Can you imagine reliving the death of your mother over and over, crying, wanting to wear black because of a luto? At other times, ¿te acuerdas? She would invent things. But that day, the day before she passed, one of my kids had his iPad with him, and I had the idea of putting it in front of her. Her face lit up, and she used my finger to type out, Los quiero mucho, perdón. I didn't know what she was asking forgiveness for, but I said, Si, si, mami, we all forgive you, we love you. She held my finger so hard it hurt. Tears ran down her face. I know she was lucid then, more so than earlier. About two years before, when she was still pretty good, you would never know anything was wrong. Do you remember, Diamond? One day, she told a friend of mine she had had a heart transplant. My friend believed it since my mom told such a convincing story. When my friend Lupita, remember her? She graduated the year before we did. Oh, yes, I forgot. You didn't graduate. Well, after I graduated. She was a year behind us in La Martin. So Lupita believed my mom and came and comes and tells me, Ay, que bueno that your mom was able to get a heart transplant. She's doing so well. Then I had to break it to her. No, no, no. My mom didn't have a transplant. She just made that story up. Like she did the story of going to New York. But the heart transplant story helped her. She actually got over her heart problems and she began telling that story. Someone sent me a link to the story about how with Alzheimer's, the body forgets it's sick. Patients get better and they live longer. I think that's what happened to my mom. You know, she was 92 when she passed. But still, de vez en cuando she would remember painful things and relive them. Pobrecita. But she stuck to her story about the heart transplant and repeated it to whoever asked, ¿Cómo está Doña Paula? Really? She told you the story? When did you, when you did her hair, huh? I don't remember that. Yes, it had to do with a 17-year-old. It went like this. One day when she was in the hospital, the doctors told her that her heart was enlarged. Porque tengo tantos hijos, que crees? She explained. The heart had grown, and she attributed it to having so many children she had to love. <laughs> when was, one has so many children, in order to love them all, pues, the heart grows. But the doctors had a solution to her enlarged heart. Otherwise, it would surely burst and she would die. They suggested a heart transplant. A young 17-year-old had just been killed in a motorcycle accident, and she could receive his heart. She talked to the young man's mother and felt, who felt it would be a good thing. My mom shared with the woman the loss of her own son, my brother, who was killed in the train accident, Ah, when he died, a large part of her died too. Eso siempre decía. How it is the worst pain any human being can endure, the loss of a child. So the mother of the young man was pleased that my mother would receive her son's heart and continue living. Y por eso, my mom would explain, I don't suffer from heart problems anymore. Ya no sufro del corazón. Diamond. Pero me pasa algo, ¿eh? También. Yeah, something else. I'm not thinking, I may be getting the symptoms. A veces se me olvidan las cosas, you know, not normal things like forgetting where you left your car keys, but serious things like one of my kids' birthdays or the name of la comadre who is standing right in front of me at church. I'm really scared, Diamond. What should I do? Yeah, I guess I should get diagnosed. But what if I'm right, no? What if I do have it? No sé, I would probably then commit suicide. I don't want to live like that, absent. Y lo peor de todo, make others suffer watching me fade away. No, no. Pues sí. If I do get a diagnosis, I could at least know what's wrong. But what if nothing's wrong? Then I don't have an excuse for the fears, ¿verdad? For forgetting things. Do you think God would forgive me for killing myself? Wonder how that works. Do you confess in advance? <laughs> <coughs> or if you're already sick, does God forgive you because you didn't really know what you were doing? I guess I would forgive myself, that's for sure. And the last piece is another short story from the collection Shampoo, uh, Making Do. And this is another character that has come into the beauty shop and is talking to Diamond. <coughs> Diamond, te voy a decir un secret, pero no le digas a nadie, okay? 
not a soul. Pues, porque entonces, it won't be a secret no more, que no? Es que ya sabes lo apurada that I've been since pinche Paco stop sending me my antimony. I'm hurting. ¿Qué, ¿Qué es? What he was ordered to give me for the kids. You know, the antimony. El juez decided that he should help me with something. Ah, bueno, bueno. Alimony. ¿Me entendites, no? It's just never enough. And now it ain't nothing at all. Anyway, since I don't have much, my pinche job only pays $5 an hour. Pues me fui de tempo. De tempo. You know, I says whatever they tell you. Yes, todo. See, see, I applied, and they hired me. So after I finished my job with the cleaning service, sí, todavía estoy con ellos. It's not so bad. Pero it pays bad. De las cuatro de la mañana till noon, trabajo every day except Sunday. Es una fiera. But what can I do? Anyway, the tempo es más divertido, and it pays better. I do all kinds of things. Como que, pues, like I work in the warehouses, en las bodegas con los chinos. Yes, yes, I know que no son chinos. They're Hindus, at least most of them. Sí, sí, en las bodegas. You know those humongous warehouses in South Laredo? That's all they hire, tempos. It's pretty tough. I work till four, the four till midnight shift. De buenas que no es every day, I couldn't do it. But así como two or three times a week, pues it's not bad. I do that y saco feria para mis gastos. Yeah, unloading stuff in those big semis. And we put toda la mercancía in the warehouses. You know, lamps, chucherias, maybe appliances, whatever. I make enough to get by. But you know how it is with the kids. There's always something. Que si no son new shoes, it's stuff for school. Esos pinches maestros always having parties asking the kids to bring stuff. Pura chingaderas. Every pinche holiday, que si Christmas or Thanksgiving or Valentine's, hasta en Easter piden algo. Me costó casi 50 bucks to buy the Easter baskets and the candy for my three kids. No me, pa' que te digo. Sí, sí, I am getting to the secret. Es que Tina, una de las chavas de las tempos invited me to earn $1,000. She does it once a month. De eso vive. It's nothing illegal. She just drives to San Antonio and back and ya. Sí, 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 que no. Too easy, I thought. So I asked what the deal was, and I found it's people she's taking up. Mm -hmm. Illegals, o como dice Paquito, undocumented. <laughs> sí, sí, los lleva San Antonio. Pues of course it's illegal to do that. Pero ella dice que no, que no es, because she doesn't ask anything, so she doesn't know anything. <laughs> and when she drives by the checkpoint, they just wave her on by. ¿Qué te parece? Should I try it? <laughs> no, pues sí, I understand. No soy tan pendeja. There is a risk. No one stops you. They just wave you on through. Cascades because we're women. But then there's another problem. My pinche car won't make it. <laughs> Eso le dije a Latina, but she, uh, she says it's no problem porque they can even provide me with a car and all. Entonces sí que me asusté. ¿Verdad que hice bien? Le dije que thanks, but no thanks. Por lo menos not yet. No estoy tan tan to get into such stuff, but it sure is tempting. What I could do with a thousand bucks. Como te digo, Tina, it's been, Tina has been doing it for a while, but you're right. <coughs> what if, verdad? Con mi maldita suerte, my kids wouldn't survive con su mamá en el bote. And my mom, oh gosh, what if I went to jail? But she would die de vergüenza. Oh yes, Diamond, can I borrow your car? <laughs> <laughs> Now we can resume with the Q&A, if you have any questions. <laughs> Macarena? National Geographic did an amazing spread about Laredo and the George Washington uh, celebrations a few years back. Right. And those dresses that they wear today don't look anything like the. So when did the change happen? Because I mean, these are $20,000 dresses that... Or 30 or 40. Uh, there's two parts of the celebration, and I, I do a presentation on the fiestas en Laredo also, so. They wear colonial dresses like unlike any colonial woman ever wore, <laughs> and, and Native American dresses for the Princess Pocahontas pageant unlike any, any Native woman ever wore. Uh, mostly what is expensive is the beading, because they're hand beaded, and just they're super elaborate. They're very heavy because of all the beadwork. And then they are in the parade on Saturday morning. 
both of them have presentation balls or parties. The Princess Pocahontas has a reenactment of a, an event that never happened. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, where the, there is a, a battle, a mock battle, between the colonize, colonizers, I guess, and the native people, and the native people win. And then they give them the keys to the city. And so Princess Pocahontas in the parade has the keys to the city. And it's all constructed. None of this ever happened. But it comes about in 1898 as a consequence of the improved order of red men having a chapter in Laredo. The Improved Order of Redmond is a fraternal organization, pretty much like the Elks and the Lions and all those, that existed around the mid-18th century, and a lot of it comes from George Washington, which is why he's celebrated, because they would, as, a colon, as the colonies were fighting against the British, they would hide, and one way of hiding was to dress up like Indians and pretend they were Indians for their meetings, and so that's where it emerges. That's the myth, anyway. Now in Laredo, that improved order of Redmond lasted very sh maybe 40 years at the most, but the celebration stayed. <laughs> and, it, and one interesting fact, in the 1940s, during World War II, the celebration could not happen in the US because of all the uh, state of, of alert that we were in, so it went to Nuevo Laredo. <laughs> Nuevo Laredo celebrated it. And traditionally, when I was growing up, the border was open. People could come and go. There was no checking of papers or anything during the celebration. Of course, now that's not the case. And with the current state of affairs because of the violence, it even was even shortened in terms of participation by the Mexican. Uh, usually it would be public schools, the military, all these groups from Mexico would come and they'd be in the parade. That's been diminished quite a bit. But it's still going on. If you're interested in February, you can Google George Washington's birthday celebration, Laredo, and you have a web page, and you have photos, and it goes on for three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, it starts like now. I think they've already selected the court. Well, no, by now, it's already in full swing. Around March, they select the court for the next year. They name somebody George and somebody Martha. <laughs> and, and they're usually the elites in the community that have a lot of money who get to occupy those sites of privilege. And then they have a court, the young 18-year-olds, daughters of the society, and some guests. The guests are non-members who have 18-year-old girls and a lot of money. <laughs> So it's, it's interesting, and yeah, ge geogra the National Geographic story was pretty good. There's also a woman, a filmmaker, Cristina Ibarra, who's making a film called Las Martas, because that's what they call the society, the women, and Las Pokies are the Pocahontas part of it. But Las Martas focuses on two young women who are being presented, who are being part of, of the debutante ball. And uh, it's a nice film. She's in production right now, but with Sandy, Everything got delayed. She's in New York, and so she's now trying to catch up somehow. Yes? When did you know that you would be a writer? And I want to know, if, where, where were the opportunities? Because I think uh, I'm quite older than you are, but I know those opportunities were not there. That encouragement and recognition was not there. I'd like to know at what point you knew it and who and what you Yeah. <laughs> I've always written. I mean, I was in third grade, and I was writing, making up stories and poems. Uh, I learned declamación as a four or five-year-old. My mother and father, my father especially, declamaba. Declamación is a poetry tradition in many communities in, in South America, especially in Mexico, where children and adults memorize these very long poems and recite them at particular feast days. I was always the one reciting for Mother's Day at church. They would put me up on a stage at age three or four, and I'd recite these from memory, these very long poems. So I think I learned to love words then, and I started writing, like I said, when I was in the third grade or something. But I didn't know I was a writer. I didn't call myself a writer until Canicula was published. And it took that long basically because of what you're saying. There was not much encouragement. There was not much of a venue for writers like myself who use Spanglish. I was already using Spanglish because that's how we talk. And I wanted to reflect that. I, I, 
I must say that I got permission, if you will, to do that from other writers like Gloria Anzaldúa and uh, Sandra Cisneros and others who were also experimenting with language in that way. But I didn't call myself a writer. I called myself a professor who writes. And after Canicula came out, I started calling myself a writer who teaches. <laughs> and it was a very difficult shift of identity. Uh, I don't know. It, it's just something that, that evolved. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Um, I know you were at UTSA for a long time. And you just retired, right? Yes. August 31st. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'll have to tell you the story. I did the Camino de Santiago in December 2010 and ended February 1st, 2011. And when I was on the Camino, I turned 64, and that Beatles song kept going on in my head, well, you know, the, when I'm 64. And for a year, I thought about all, you know, turning 65 and all that. And then when I turned 65, on January 3rd, I turned 65, and I was writing a blog called El Camino a Year Later. So I was meditating on walking that Camino. If, for those of you who don't know, it's a pilgrimage route in northern Spain. I walked for two months, it's uh, 500 miles. It's a 500 mile trip. And it's very spiritual, although it doesn't necessarily have to be religious, but it was a very spiritual experience. And so when I woke up on January 4th, the first day after my 61st birthday, I just knew I had to retire. <laughs> and I went in before I could think about it too long and filed the paperwork and did it. And uh, one of the nice things was that UTSA was offering a kind of a, a golden, whatever they call it, yeah, parachute. So that, you know, they'll give me one year's salary. That's how I'm able not to teach right now. Because <laughs> I'm not cashing in on my retirement fund yet. I'm going to wait until about five years from now. I feel that I still have a lot of work to do. So even though I'm retired from UTSA and the system in Texas, I'm not really retired from teaching and working and doing other things. But it was a real, uh, I, well, for me anyway, it was something that I knew I had to do. I just didn't know I was going to do it. I always said I'm never going to retire. I'm going to work, and I'm going to be teaching with my walker. <laughs> One of my models is Don, uh, Luis um, Leal who was a professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara, when I was there. And he taught until he was 98. And he was sharp as a tack. And, and I mean, students were just, you know, he had an encyclopedic mind. Everybody was just like, ah. Oh. And I thought, that's how I want to be. So I, I, I'm retired, but I'm not. <laughs> Did you have a, a follow-up question? Uh, well, no, I was just going to ask, uh, what was next for you? you know? Because I, I figured you're not entirely retired yet. One of the benefits of being an academic is you don't have to retire. You can continue working. And of course, being a writer, you can write as long as you want. Uh, I'm going to be moving to Kansas City in January. And I'm taking on a position there in the Department of English. But it is to start a Latino Studies undergraduate program. And the plan with one of my colleagues there, uh, Miguel Carranza, is to develop a template for a Latino studies undergraduate program that can be duplicated anywhere uh, where universities are gonna have to respond to our demographic change and provide this major. It's amazing what it does for retention. When students take classes that they see themselves reflected in the literature or in the history, it just attracts them, they, they don't quit. They stay in college and they, of course, go on and do other things like law or medicine or whatever. But having those courses there is critical for our population. And so that's why it's like my new mission. <laughs> I came to San Antonio 12 years ago to start the PhD in English with a Latino literature emphasis. And I was very proud to say that we have graduated 20 students out of that PhD program very successfully, placed them in jobs. And also, the, the most amazing thing Five, I believe, maybe six, have received four foundation fellowships. These are fellowships that are super competitive. It used to be Berkeley, Stanford, you know, Yale, places like that got these fellowships. Well, UTSA has five of those. So I'm very proud of that work, too. Yeah. Thank you.
Well, thank you all for attending. And uh, I want to thank there. all of you very much. <laughs> and go ahead. And we have uh, books out in the hall, and then uh, Professor Kamtu will be there to sign and, and speak more with you individually. And we'll welcome you all back on November 29th for Jake Adam York, who will be here. He's a poet uh, that will be joining us for our next speaker, the last one of the semester. So thank you all very much. Thank you.